This next unit is called thermochemistry. This is a really short lesson and there's two lessons within this um, component. So this is just kind of giving us the background of what thermochemistry is and we're going to start doing a little bit of calculations with it. So thermochemistry, if you want a very simple definition, is we're looking at the energy changes in pretty much any process we have. So if you think back to maybe early grade 9, grade 10 years, you classified things as physical change and chemical change. So we mostly will be looking at chemical processes, but that's what it means by physical processes as well. So any process, the energy that is going to be used, absorbed, or released <clears throat> by the reaction. Anyways, so energy, this is much more a physics slide, so we won't go too in depth with it. But um, in our eyes, there are two different types of energy that we can classify, either it be kinetic energy, so motion, or potential energy, the stuff that's stored, like what's stored in the bonds of compounds and molecules. So if we're talking about energy, we'll probably end up putting a value to that. And most values that you've seen when you did stoichiometry in grade 11, obviously have a unit, an SI unit, that standard unit um, of measurement that when you put it into equations, we'll always have to use. So for us, that is a joule. And a joule is a crazy um, unit, and hence the reason why we only use J. So a joule is very, very small. So a lot of the time we will be seeing things as kilojoules. Uh, just remember that when you do do calculations, typically we're gonna have to make sure that we multiply that by a thousand so that it's a joule when we throw it into some sort of calculation. Um, energy is also calculated as a calorie. So, um, like the energy that you eat. Obviously, if you look at a food label, that's written as calories. Um, one joule, or I should say one calorie, sorry, is equal to 4.184 joules. Um, food, joule, or food calories are actually not a normal calorie. They're kilocalories. So how it says here that a joule is super small, um, if we were to look at a food label and see something be labeled as one calorie, um, that's actually going to be a thousand calories. It's a kilo calorie that they're actually representing there. Obviously, you'd be a little bit scared to eat something, though, if it said it had a thousand calories in it. Anyways, so let's look at how energy can be um, transferred. So there's two definitions here. We have system and surroundings, and they're in each of these uh, little images. So a system is pretty much our reaction. So our reactants and our products make the system. Surroundings outside of this circle is pretty much anything else in the world. So uh, obviously, if you had a reaction, if you were in a real chemistry lab, uh, something down the hallway probably wouldn't even be significant to you. So even though that's the surroundings, we usually don't worry about that. It'd be something that's close by. So um, obviously we can sometimes try to limit those surroundings at times. We want to stop our flask or use maybe um, a ventilated area that's separated from the rest of the room and enclose it a little bit better. Um, there's, there's different ways to limit your surroundings. So we have three different ways in which our system and surroundings can actually um, exchange energy and matter. And that will be on the next two slides as well. So let's just kind of look at a clip of what they look like. So we have open, closed, and isolated systems. Um, just depending on what's able to transfer between surrounding and system is which name it gets. So if you're capable of matter coming and going, as well as energy can come and go between the system and surroundings, you have a completely open system. 
if it's closed, matter can no longer be transferred in or out, but energy still can. And if it's completely isolated, energy nor matter can go in between the system and surroundings. So let's see how we could actually um, see those three different ideas. So if we had a test tube, open would be a test tube that isn't stoppered. So you could have vapor going out and you'd be losing some gases. So that would be matter. Um, you could also probably feel that test tube and depending on the reaction, it might feel hot or cold. So you're feeling heat being released or absorbed. So that's the energy movement as well. So that would be an open system. We've probably done some experiments in the past where we put a stopper on something. So now we've made sure that all those fumes, the vapors stay within our system. We've closed it off, but I could still hold this with my hand and still feel that heat or that coldness. So energy can still be transferred in and out. We could stop that by putting some sort of insulation around the test tube. And that way um, we can stop the, the energy transfer. So those are some cartoon drawings. If we wanted to see kind of real world things, we could have an open beaker. Again, things can just drift right on out. We could have vapors coming out. Instead, we could stopper it and then it will stay inside. We've obviously got that condensation going on. And here we can't even tell what's happening because it's isolated. So there's something inside of that little drum. So we're talking about energy transfer and I was talking about feeling a test tube and maybe it's hot, maybe it's cold. And that depends on which way the heat is being transferred. If it's going into our system or exiting our system. So we've got two different processes here. We have endothermic processes and we have exothermic processes. So endo, enter, that's when we have heat entering or absorbing into our system. So that's our arrows. We've got heat coming from the surroundings and going into our system. So it says it feels cold, which kind of sometimes is hard to understand because you think, okay, heat's being absorbed. Shouldn't that feel warm? but it's being absorbed into the system and we aren't part of the reaction. We're part of the surroundings, right? So we're losing that heat. So if we have an endothermic reaction and the system is absorbing heat, we're part of the surroundings. We're losing that heat. We feel the coldness because we're losing it. The exact opposite process would be exothermic. Exit, heat is being released. So we've got our reaction we're losing heat from the reaction, but this is when we touch the um, test tube and it feels warm because we're losing that heat to the surroundings, which would be our hand touching um, that test tube. So two different directions of heat transfer, whether it's going in, enter, endothermic, or leaving, exo, exit, exothermic. A few definitions for you. Um, thermal energy is pretty much a definition we won't be using because it cannot be measured. So that's the sum of all kinetic energies. The one that we do measure when it comes to kinetic energies is the average kinetic energy of the system. So that's temperature when we're, we're using a thermometer. So if we were to do thermochemistry in a real classroom, we'd be doing um, a lot of thermometer work and testing kind of the temperature of um, a solution before and after reaction. Heat is also something that's gonna come up um, and we'll look at a little bit more in the next coming slides as we put it into some calculations. Whoopsie, I think I went by something. Um, three more definitions and one of these will be used a lot more than the other two. So um, this guy right here, lowercase c, specific heat capacity, it's going to be used quite regularly. Um, depending on classes you've taken in the past, specific heat capacity might be something that you've looked at before, maybe actually in geography, where you looked at um, land masses near water and not near water, and how 
land masses near water, their temperature was usually regulated. We don't have super hot summers or super cold winters versus places that aren't near water and that they could have like more erratic temperatures, colder winters, hotter summers. And that's because of the specific heat capacity of rock versus water. So specific heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of any substance by a full degree Celsius. So if we have a lower specific heat capacity, like that of water, it's going to take more heat to raise it by one degree, even if we have the same volume. Versus water, or sorry, versus rock, which has a lower specific heat capacity, and it's going to take more heat in order to raise it. So specific heat capacity is always going to be found on a, um, on a table. So you're pretty much never going to have to find that one. It's just going to be something that you can look up. The difference being that specific heat capacity looks at specifically a certain mass. Heat capacity is literally of any mass, so it's not very helpful because it could be a small sample of a rock. It could be a huge sample of a rock. We're just looking at the heat capacity of something in general, which isn't very helpful. Obviously, this is something you wouldn't be able to look up somewhere because it's very specific to whatever um, sample you have. And then there's molar heat capacity, which instead of looking at the mass, we're now looking at a full mole. So anyways, um, here come the calculations. So our uh, calculation for the day is what I call the MCAT equation, because to me this looks like MCAT, MCAT. Um, and each of these is a different variable that we're going to go together and find what Q equals. So Q is heat. And obviously it's affected by these three variables, M being mass, C being the specific heat capacity, so the type of substance we have, and delta T being how much of a temperature change we're actually making. So just in case you want to see it in a different way, we have um, our same variables, and this time we also have our um, units. So heat was that joule we were talking about before. Mass is always grams, like it was when you're doing stoichiometry last year. We just saw a specific heat capacity for the first time a couple slides ago. So it's joules per gram degree Celsius. And temperature change is going to be in Celsius for us. And you'll be able to see how grams times degrees Celsius ends up canceling with the grams and degrees Celsius on the bottom of specific heat capacity, leaving us with just joules for heat for our unit. Um, it's a good thing to know how to cancel out units as well, because maybe you're not always going to try to be finding Q. Maybe mass will be the unknown or something within the temperature. Uh, to make sure that you know how to reorganize this equation to solve for something else. Anyways, so let's do one problem together and it's already solved for us uh, just to make sure that we know how to do it. So nothing too, too advanced, but make sure that you do have a scientific calculator for this unit and will really help when we get to some other stuff. So we're looking at a mass of 1.25 kilograms. Cool. We might have to play around with that number a bit, right? Because we know our SI unit for mass is not kilograms, it is grams. So we might have to change that when it gets over into our equation. So that's why these two numbers don't match, right? I multiply by a thousand in order to get to a grams unit. So we have 1.25 kilograms of water heated in a kettle. His temperature increased from 16.4 to 98.9. So from two, here's our final temperature. There's our initial. We're gonna do a little bit of subtraction 
I usually do it before I actually put it into the equation. I find that I will make mistakes sometimes otherwise. So up to you if you like doing it right in the equation or if you like to figure it out before you insert it. Um, obviously that's a personal thing. So we have delta T. How much heat did the water absorb? So you're thinking, ah, oh, I was never given C. But specific heat capacity, remember, is one of those things that might not be given to you, but you could always look up on a chart. So that's posted within this lesson. So specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. And we can plug that into our equation. All we really have to do is multiply these three values and we'll get this number spat out at the end. And this is what I was saying about joules being our standardized unit. But a joule is super, super small. So especially if you wanted to use um, sig figs, it'd be hard and weird to, to limit your numbers here. So instead, we can divide by 1,000 and change our joules unit to kilojoules. And that is a much more practical number to look at. So anyways, this is the first half of the lesson. The second one's in a second video. Uh, there's some practice to do with our MCAT equation before we get to the new stuff.